always know this story, but we also have a lot of listeners who are not part of ISKCON, who are part of the wider Godia Vaishnav community, and so uh, they don't have the pleasure of, of knowing your story. So maybe we can start off there, Maharaj. Uh-huh. Well, you know, my story is one of uh, growing up in post-war Netherlands, where um, a nation that was uh, quite battered by the Second World War, I was born eight years after, so there were still many traces. And uh, my parents went through the, the Second World War, and uh, they were the generation, they were 20 when it started, so they were the generation after the war that was really meant to build things back up. And so they did. And to their credit, you know, they worked very hard and, uh, and made it all possible. And, uh, but that's why that generation was a little focused on material development and nothing, nothing spiritual. There was just no time for it. And uh, so, so I was typically a child of a generation that sang, money can buy you love and that uh, looked for spirituality and uh, so when i was 17 i started to travel and uh, heading east and eventually came to uh, to india and uh, yeah that was like quite an experience um i didn't know in those days i wrote a song i'm nothing but a seeker for what I've never found. I'm, I'm nothing but a stranger, always around. So I had a sense of not belonging anywhere. But I was moving around and looking for something, and I knew that when I'll find it, I'll know that it's the truth. But until then, where it is, I have no idea. Meanwhile, I thought it had to be spiritual. I came to the border in India over land, and there was an old Sikh, a man with a big turban and a huge mustache, enormous, sitting under a tree. And that was his office, which I liked a lot. Then he asked me, I had just been in Pakistan, and they made a trip about a stamp in my passport. So I held out my passport, you know, put stamp, stamp, stamp. And uh, the man said, why have you come to India? So I said, well, um, I heard India is a very spiritual country. He said, ah, then you will go to Varanasi. Ah, and I said, you know, I, I mean, you don't argue with someone in a uniform. So I said, yes, 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 I will go. And then he said, yes, you will go because I will buy you the tickets. And he did. Oh, wow. So that was really nice, you know, a, a real a real wonderful introduction to India. He just bought my ticket, went to Varanasi, and then that whole atmosphere of worship on the Ganga and, and all these things. And yeah, eventually I, I picked up the latest top hit that was always played 24 hours on, on the guts in Varanasi, which was so I also uh, started uh, chanting it and uh, later as I drove on the highway in the Netherlands. It stayed with me. And I also sang it for my mother who... who uh, was dying of cancer in those days. Yeah. So in her final moments, although I didn't know, but I felt it, you know, that this was the thing to do. So I chanted the mantras to her at her final moment. Lucky me, and maybe also and lucky her to be blessed by the names of Lord Ramachandra. Yeah, I'm still happy about about that. And then you got in, did you, you went to India and you got in touch with devotees there in India? Mm, you know, in 1975, I saw this devotee and he just crossed the street and I couldn't make it through the traffic. I missed him. If I would have met him, I might have gone to the uh, Krishna Balra Mandir for the opening, but I didn't. Right. Right. So it, uh, it only, uh, only happened a little later, you know, like 
77 I started to get into Krishna consciousness then by the in early 78 I, I moved into the temple in in um Netherlands no, Vrindavan, Vrindavan. Oh, Vrindavan. Was how was that I mean for an, a, a European person to live in Vrindavan in those days what was what was that like <laughs> well Vrindavan was very nice Vrindavan was much uh you know it was very simple. There were three cars a day coming to Vrindavan. There were like mainly Tongas coming in, like those horse carts with the wobbly wheels and coming yeah. in from uh, from Matura. And people would come by cha by train. And, uh, you know, like yeah, in the back of the Krishna Balarama Mandi was Raman Reti. And in the evening, you could see 60 peacocks assembling there. In the afternoon, the, the cows were resting there. The Krishna Balaram tree was there. And all the peacocks would sleep in the trees. In fact, there were even, even along the main road, there were peacocks sleeping in the trees. And peacocks were our alarm clocks. That's, that's what you heard. You heard just at 3 a.m., waves of peacocks calling out. It was a very simple Vrindavan. Um, it was a very nice window. There was no telecommunications, no no podcasts, no computer. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing. It's it just just like um, water from the well. Yeah. I stayed near a ghost shell in a house. Uh, water from the well, and uh, and it was. Uh, very very basic you know clay pots mats to sleep on uh, clothes in a trunk so that the rats wouldn't eat them yeah i liked it very much what was yeah. your first service there um the first day i helped in the, in the restaurant then there then there was the devotee that was in charge unfortunately i found him in an in, in a difficult situation in the kitchen with one lady and uh, and he left because of it and uh yeah the second day i was the manager of the restaurant wow like that and i was thinking then you know i was quite shocked because the senior devotee that i had sort of expected was going to inspire me turned out to have difficulty and I thought now what and then I thought well I guess instead of looking at others you know I think I should just try to be the uh, yeah be the example myself try to of course I was new so I didn't know how but I took that mood and, and then you were then you were, because you were the manager of the restaurant, and then eventually, I think you became the manager of the whole temple, right? Yeah, yeah. Then I became a general manager. Then I, because I was new, so they didn't want to give me a big title, so they made me general manager. Mm -hmm. Then I was managing pretty much the temple. Later, of course, I was temple president also in Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. When you, when you see Vrindavan now, and you see you saw Vrindavan in the in the past. You know those times you're 60 peacocks the you know you can see all the way through and everything what is your feeling of seeing it now yeah well that one uh, has changed a lot you know of course i'm also thinking how people who from the from the 40s would have seen the vrindavan that i first saw <laughs> right right so, uh, <laughs> you can't stop the modern world and uh, of course vrindavan has become urbanized and, in, and and that covers the uh, Vrindavan a little bit. It's not so transparent to Vrindavan. Whereas really what we should be doing in Vrindavan is create transparency to the Dham as much as we can. Right? That's how we used to live in Vrindavan. We used to think about that. How to be transparent to the Dham and not in any way obscure, uh, at least not obscured by our presence. So yeah, now it's uh, it's obviously, but if you go out to a little bit out of the town to the villages, ah, then you're back, you're completely back in the old Vrindavan. So Vrindavan mm. still Vrindavan. That's where I'm heading. I'm going to Vrindavan. Mm. 
Right, right. That's it. Seems like you know that's where you joined, uh, and yeah. and that's like home for you. You know, it's, it's it is home. Yeah, it is yeah. home. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested. How did you kind of navigate challenging situations there in Vrindavan? I know you were, you had a challenging situation there uh, at while well, you were the temple president, and also just the '80s uh, in general in Iskon was like a very challenging situation. So you, had, you did mention, okay, you, you felt you had to be the example when you saw someone having difficulty, but. Um, are there any other lessons that you learned going through that uh, situation there in Vrindavan? Well, yeah, you know, um, I had traveled in India before, before I joined, right? So extensively, uh, year after year, you know, I would go back to Vrindavan I, or to India. I would say I'd go to India, travel all over India. So by the time I moved to Vrindavan, I was seasoned in India, you know, quite seasoned. So I never felt any difficulty uh, working the Indian way, you know, which is sometimes a little, you know. <laughs> That's a good way to put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> a little money has to grease a palm or whatever, you know. Right, I, right. I could, could handle that stuff in, in some ways. Hmm. Easier to work that way than to work with the impersonal system. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, the Vindavan of the uh, 70s and 80s was a Vrindavan that was uh, uh, just basic amenities were a real struggle, you know, just to have water, just to have electricity, just uh, just to be able to, just cooking. So there was a lot of effort that went into keeping that operation going. You know. uh, yeah, then there were many complexities with the local community. Right. And, and uh, you know, and obviously, because our project represented a lot of money, it also attracted certain elements who were after that money. Uh, and, and that was also something we had to deal with over time. Sometimes officials, sometimes uh, people from the local mafia, you name it. Right? Uh, yeah, one big official one time called me and said, OK, yeah. You must give 10, 10 lakhs to to my my uh, my party fund. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, things like wow. it was exciting like that, <laughs> not boring, and uh, it was challenging. And I kind of uh, I like that, you know, situations where you have where you're challenged and where you have to be resilient. So I felt like a fish in the water. Um, and you didn't, I mean, most people would, you know, just kind of like hang in the towel and just like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. The, the things that you went through there, I mean, I, how did you, I still don't understand. How can you still continue doing what you were doing with all those challenges? Well, uh, you know, uh, of course, in, in, in 95, when I, when I finally got shot, right, that was uh, very challenging. Right. Um, but mind you, in, in 19, uh, I was in Vindavan from 78 to 84. Then I went one year to Australia for a break because I'd been very ill in uh, Vindavan with uh, malaria. I would had uh, malaria 12 times in, in 1984. And as a result, I become very weak and skinny. So Bhavananda was in charge. Bhavananda told me, go to Australia for some time. You know, so I went to Australia for some time. And I arrived in Melbourne and I saw that the sparrows were twice as fat as in India. So that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I was underweight, you know. So anyway, so indeed, after a while, I did gain weight in Melbourne. So it was the right place to be. Right. Um, so I was there for a break, and then I, then Bhavananda asked me to go to Mayapur, which I did, and uh, I became involved in uh, in in construction. He made me in charge of all construction in Mayapur, which then included the samadhi, the 
the the current uh, Radha Madhava temple, the, the Sringa temple, the uh, the conch building, the courtyard there, the police station, some housing projects and, and stuff like that. Wow. And, and, and also all the electric cabling, you know, 11,000 volt cables and substations and all that. So I, I was involved in, in all of that. And uh, well, that was very demanding. So that period in Mayapur was a period of uh, haggling with contractors, getting documents from governments, uh, buying uh, uh, very expensive building materials all over India and so on. And, uh, and in Calcutta, quite, I spent three days a week in, in Calcutta, which also was a little, was tough on me. I did, you know, I mean, I, the austerity of India, I didn't mind, but when it was in a city like Calcutta, it didn't have so much to motivate me. You know, being in the Dham was the Dham, right? So you tolerate because after all, you're in the Dham. But Calcutta was austere. Poof. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there was no water in the temple. And then we had to go in the Pukur, in the pond, just opposite the temple. Well, where the water comes from, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was it. That was it. Yeah. So. And what year? And when did you take sannyas? What year was that? Okay, you're jumping to sannyas now. Well, oh. I'm, okay, I can can just finish this one point. Please, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's good. Right. In 1990, I was asked to go to Vrindavan to become the temple president. Oh. And uh, because there were problems in Vindav, there, there had been some infiltration of uh, the wrong community. There was a person who was a manager who was from a Panda community. Pandas are often manipulative and exploitive. And he had become more and more influential in the temple and had really extended his tentacles throughout the entire project and things were getting more and more out of hand. Um, there was a lot of corruption, uh, call it, yeah, uh, the Italian N-word, you know, uh, that, that kind of uh, people were, were an infiltrated in the temple. So they asked me to, uh, to come and, and clean things up. So actually, uh, that person, he was uh, he was murdered. He was murdered in our in our guest house, and uh, because by a devotee, and the devotee thought that this this guy is a demon, he is destroying his skull. So he took the law in his own hand and did something. Um, it was a big drama. You know this this person. Uh, yeah. Anyway, his name is well known. He, Kilan was was at the time uh, an influential manager in the temple, and uh, but there were all kinds of strange things going on in the temple. Mm -hmm. Some say even 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 prostitution was happening in the guest house. Anyway. Foreign girls. So I was sent in to, to clean things up, and I did. Very careful, as they call, Prince, uh, with love. But, you know, that all. Uh, so in the end, the empire struck back in, after five years. And uh, I, I mean, I always thought something could happen, but they went, they went quite far by uh, getting into the building. It was a very well uh, prepared murder attempt that I went through in 95. But I somehow or other survived it. Yeah. So I felt that bullet, right? I, it's quarter to nine. I went to the, the bathroom, which I used to do before taking rest, this, that. And uh, so I was quite regular, same time there every night. They knew the normal shower block where I used to go, there was no water. 
So I went to the nearest shower block, which is on the front side of the building. It's in the building. I just went to the into the, the toilet stalls, and it was a whole row of them. So, and and lights went off. In India, I don't think about that. Light went off. Suddenly, lights went back on. Someone went into <laughs> the toilet next to mine, which, you know, that's also normal. Until suddenly I got shot over the, over the top wall. There was a space to the ceiling. I got shot over the top wall. When the bullet hit me, I, I, I immediately, it went in slow motion. And I had three thoughts. One thought was, I got shot. Second thought was, it's an inside job. Third thought was, don't black out. And I fell on the ground and I started pranayam to stay conscious. After about 15 minutes, I managed to pull myself up, got out of that toilet and made it onto the veranda. Okay. Well, then took quite a while to get some help and this and that, and, uh, but eventually made it to a hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did it hit you? In my back, got shot in the back and came out in the front. Wow. Was, uh, took one and a half years. It's not like, uh, like in, in some spaghetti Western movie, you know, like get shot and three days later, you drive away on your horse. And it was more like one and a half years. I was totally, uh, totally out of it. I couldn't keep up with anything. And it was just some, it was the group of the, of the people you're trying to clean up from all, all the kind of bad things that were happening there. Wow. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. In and out, both, some were inside, some were outside. Yeah, well, you know, water under the bridge. <laughs> I, I don't understand, Mahar. I don't understand how that can be water under the bridge. I mean, it's like you're, you're just trying to do your service and you're trying to, you know, make <laughs> things more moral and, and you just get shot. And Well, you know, I mean, that's that's a sensitive service, so you know you can get shot for less. Yeah, it's the sort of <laughs> thing, right. sort of thing you can get shot for. So it wasn't so surprising. I mean, and you recovered there in Vrindavan, or was it in Australia that you immediately went to Australia? No, 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 no. At that time, I didn't go to Australia. I, at that time, I uh, they, they, the initial uh, you know the initial operation, etc., was done in, in Mathura because I didn't want to go out of the dam. You know, I mean, uh, you get shot in Vrindavan and you die in Delhi sort of thing. Forget it. Right. So I went, so they did the op in, in Mathura. And actually, uh, the man was quite experienced. He had uh, dealt with gunshots before because it's not so uncommon in Vrindavan area. So he knew how to deal with it. So he did a good job. And uh, then I went to uh, Mumbai for follow-up. And I stayed there for a while. Um, I stayed in India for a while, but when it got really hot, I felt too weak to deal with it. Then Prabhupada said that when you, uh, when your health is down, go to your place of birth. So I went to the Netherlands, which was like, you know, it was a little difficult because I wound up in this tiny little temple, a little storefront, you know, in Amsterdam. And it was just like, a matchbox, you know, and, and one day I, I I just said to the people, you know, I said, my God, you know, this place is just a matchbox. And you guys, you talk about matches all day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so small, you know, after coming from this huge, from these big projects, right? it was just like a, a big cultural adjustment for me. Yeah. Very cool. How did you... You know, we talk about forgiveness as a as a Vaishnav quality. How do you do forgive those people who had done that to you and move forward in your Krishna consciousness, like in such a profound way? You know, as as you know now, you know many disciples and and traveling and things like that. What what was that? Do you remember what was your feeling of of, of for, forgiveness or acceptance of, of what happened? Well, I was lying in the hospital bed. You know, like I was. Uh... 
yeah, first first part of his own consciousness that so when I was off the tubes at one stage, right? I was then I was conscious and I was thinking and uh, um, yeah, then I was thinking about the, the Bhagavatam and about Dharma with the broken legs, you know, and and when Dharma was asked, who is responsible for for this, you know, and Dharma was. Saying it was pointing at all kinds of causes, right? He did not say it, it was him, it was him. Dharma looked at deeper causes. So I also looked at deeper causes. And of course, you know, I I was thinking that the people who got involved with this are uh, to a to a certain degree crazy, right? For going so far in their life you know, to, to act in such a way. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I can, can pray that their madness will be resolved somehow or other by an arrangement of Krishna without too much suffering and without too much trouble. In that sense, I can forgive them and so on. Um, and I, I was not looking at them as the main cause, I was really looking at Krishna as the main cause and thinking, okay, why is Krishna doing all this to me? Right? And I could see there were different different things at play at the time. You know, um, I'm I'm writing a novel, and which you will surely want to hear about later on. <laughs> but uh, I'm writing a novel, and in there there's a chapter which is called "All in One Shot." Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, you know, I go into the story a bit there. And, um, you know, first of all, I am, I, I, I'm a blunt Dutchman, you know, we are bold people, right? It's like a bold culture in the country, you know, small country going all over the world. So I have that boldness in me. And uh, yeah, you know, so I decided, okay, I wanted to take some yas. I, I wasn't, uh, I was 40 years old when I decided I wanted to take sannyas. I don't know how old you are now. Uh, you I'm know. 37. Okay, <laughs> you have three more years. Until <laughs> 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 see, you know, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so I started, I, I, I got married early. So I also, so I'd been married for 20 years then. And uh, so at 40, I applied for sannyas. And uh, this thing happened when I was 42. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, like uh, I could see, well, uh, I just socially died. Yeah. Everything I was, you know, I couldn't be again. Right. You know, like I couldn't go back to my service in Vrindavan because they never got the people. It's like I was still a target, you know. So I had to sort of move on, you know, in life. And I remember I went to Vrindavan after the shooting, after some time, and I went by a back road, you know what I mean? Like via Garuda Govinda Temple and then through the fields, and then suddenly I was there, you know. And and I said to the car, the driver, I'll leave at six. And I told everyone I'm leaving at six. At four, I left with another car. Uh, wow. Another route. <laughs> and uh, I was in Vrindavan, but I felt like a ghost because I couldn't be myself. I, mm. could, I was just looking at the world where I used to live, but I was not able to go back in there. So I very much realized it's over. I just have to start a new life somewhere. And uh, that was one of the, of the things that came in that shot. Yeah, there were other things too, you know. Um, I was involved. Yeah, ISKCON went through its own history, uh, as you know. And at the time we had that Rasika Bhakti issue where a lot of devotees were going to Narayan Maharaj for to hear more about Rasika matters and particularly some of the big leaders in our movement, right, including Tamal Krishna Maharaj and, and others. Um, so at that time, um, 
I was, as temple president, I felt responsible. This is happening in, in, in my area. Many, many devotees here are getting involved in it. So I felt I have to bring this thing to the GBC body, you know, and I wrote a report and I got that to the GBC. And um, yeah, so during that whole time, it was certainly a, a very confrontational, you know, and I had to sort of uh, confront my seniors, which I had to do in the course of my duty, I did. But I could also see after it was over that Krishna said, okay, 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 you became a tiger during this period, but now be a mouse again. And uh, so that bullet definitely made me a mouse again. You know, I, I had to just uh, sit on the bench for, for one and a half years and just sort of uh, not be a big player. You know, I've become such a big player, but I psh, be a mouse again. So I could see Krishna was, Krishna is described as Daksha, as one who's very expert. So he taught me many things in one shot. Yeah. He made me socially dead before I took sannyas. He, he, he made me a mouse again after I'd become too much of a tiger. He, uh, although I did it in the course of service and I did it for a, a right cause. So it's not reactions to offenses or something like that. Some people might say, aha, reaction. No, no, not reactions to offenses. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about Krishna simply said, now begin to practice some humility. Be a mouse again. And did you feel that going towards sannyas and, and doing that helped yeah. in that way? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it forced me to, uh, to really reflect in that time. I, I lost everything I had, you know, my whole life, basically, you know. I mean, if something happens, I don't wish it upon you, but to say if something happens in your whole life, just from one minute to the next, just boom, finished. Yeah. And you got to start again. And it wasn't easy. I landed in, uh, in, in the Netherlands with $100 in my pocket. <laughs> so it was, uh, was a bit, uh, and I, I, I landed in a matchbox, you know, so it was like, uh, whoa, where am I? <laughs> For the devotees who are listening, there's about 250 people listening, the uh, devotees listening. Um, we're going to be taking questions also in the chat. So if you put, if you have any questions, please put in the chat and we'll be able to ask Maharaj in a bit. Um, so after that, Maharaj, uh, then you took sannyas and then where were you based after that? Um, well, you know, like, one place that played a significant role in my life was South Africa, mm -hmm. um, because in 95, two years before Sonia's, I, uh, I stayed in the Netherlands, but when the Netherlands was getting very cold, I couldn't handle it any longer. So then Tairveta Swami, he had experience with South Africa. He says, go there, it's a good place, doctors, this, that. So I went there. And the climate was good. They had Ayurveda as well. So, you know, I really uh, went for Ayurvedic treatment there. And uh, yeah, in this way, I made my connection with South Africa. They really looked after me, although they didn't know me personally, which I very much appreciate. And uh, in the end of that stay in 95, I, I wanted to do some preaching and I started to do some preaching. And because Prabhupada always wanted us to do something with the African community, I started to reach out a bit to the African community. And uh, yeah, that became uh, one of the things I did over the years in South Africa. So after I took Sanya, South Africa certainly became a substantial place where I spent three to four months a year in different visits. And uh, eventually, I developed. Uh, one day, I came to Soweto, and uh, you know, which is is a black township, 
south of Johannesburg, we're connected to Johannesburg. And a lot of, uh, you know, during apartheid, they moved the African people in there. And uh, um, one day it came, there was a small preaching center and they had a video and they were looking at, uh, at videos of Ratiyatra Kirtans and they were dancing in front of the TV. And I came there and they were like dancing like crazy in front of the TV in this kirtan. When I saw that, I thought, Man, these people, you know, they must have their own Ratiyatra. Yeah? Right. So, so that's where I felt I must do a Ratiyatra here in Soweto. Um, so that wasn't so easy, you know, to, to start Soweto Ratiyatra because it's not one of the first things I did that came after some time, but, uh, you know, um, I did have a team by then. So uh, in the Johannesburg area, the preaching wasn't so developed. In Durban, it was more developed at the time. So they had good... One of the problems was there weren't enough devotees in, uh, in Soweto to, to put on a ratiyatra. And also, and I didn't want to import a whole lot of Indian people you know, because it sends out the wrong message, you know, it had to be African, at least predominantly African. So we brought in, we did a student retreat. We invited Dave and Rita Swami to do the student retreat with students from Durban, put them on buses, six hour drive, put them up, gave them like, you know, gave them, gave them a really first class retreat with Dave and Rita Swami. And, and then they all joined Ratiyatra. And I was really like, uh, so then we had like a few hundred uh, African people and we taught them kirtan and put them in t-shirts and, you know. So then we had a whole crew for Ratiyatra. So it looked African. And it was a huge success. It was big because after all, it was a party. It was colorful. There was dance, there was music. How could it go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Had to be a success. Right? They loved Ratiyatra. All of Soweto loved Ratiyatra. The cops were dancing. They were cops, but they were dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so South Africa became one of your stops on your circuit, so to yeah, say. Yeah, one of one of the main stops, I would say. Mm -hmm. What other what other stops were there? Um, well, Australia. I had uh, been in Australia. That, that break that I took from India, I've been in Australia, so I had relationships in Australia, and I knew Australia. I had uh, done traveling Sankatan in Australia, so I knew Australia quite well. Even speak some Australian, mate, no worries, I can, you know, I can, uh, can like it. It's one of the lingos that I can sort of, uh, you know. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no worries, she'd be right. And, uh, you know. Now, I've been out there in the whoop whoops on the farm at a station in the in the outback with the ruse and uh, you know, so. <laughs> I've done my done my time, mate. I've done my time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and and, uh, and so then you were just traveling constantly, right? Since that since until now, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've always traveled, you know, it's like uh beef uh, as I said, from my 17th till my 25th, I traveled before Krishna consciousness. Mm. Um, right. then, then I stayed in Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan, Vrindavan had a big zone in those days. So I traveled in the Vrindavan zone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then after I took sannyas, and then I traveled again around the world. So, uh, you know, I, I have a vata pita constitution so it's something like i guess it's something like a forest fire <laughs> i guess that's that's sort of the it moves fast mm. and it's hot yeah right i know it's it's fashionable to be cool but i'm more, <laughs> i guess I'm not so not so cool i'm more hot right right um maraj so you know, after we heard that message that you wrote to everyone about your health and, and all, um, a lot of devotees were shocked and a lot of devotees were upset and, 
and I know you know your your many disciples um, are listening. So, what was your feeling hearing this news uh, from the doctors, and also that would affect your traveling and your ab- ability to you know go go and meet other devotees and you know do your normal circuit as a as a sannyasi and as a guru? Um, tell us a little bit about what you're feeling uh, when you heard that news. Well, okay, you know, um, Yahoo's, uh, it's, it's not like, uh, oh, great news. But um, mm-hmm. let's say like this, six years ago, I had cancer for the first time. Right? At that stage, localized in the rectum and this and that. And with some operations uh, and and after that, lots of Ayurveda. I did okay during the last six years. However, it it came back with a, with a vengeance. Now, um, I've also had for many years uh, some prostate issues, enlarged prostate, benign, large, enlarged prostate. When, once you have that, then you have to go a lot to the bathroom at night. So, you know, I would go every hour or something like that for quite some years. And, uh, but that started to get worse last winter. You know, I mean, I'm in the Northern Hemisphere. So around, I was, I was traveling around in a van for a while and it was getting more and more difficult, you know, and especially in a van and, going to bathrooms all the time was very inconvenient. So it was noticeably increasing. And uh, at one point, I decided to, uh, to physically check the prostate, you know, just with my finger. And uh, it felt hard like a rock. So that I sort of found out in, uh, I guess, in February, that the prostate was like very hard. Google will tell you that that's not a good thing, right? So I, I was sort of expecting there might be prostate cancer. So I went to South Africa, you know, to my good doctor team who helped me six years earlier to double check. And uh, yeah, you know, I expected that there might be prostate cancer. But uh, of course, I didn't expect that it would be metastasized cancer from the colon into the prostate and into the lungs. You know, if it would have been prostate cancer, then there are many treatments. And, and if worse comes to worse, they take out the prostate and, you know, and so on. So I was mentally prepared for that, but it was a level worse. And, oh, well, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, I can deal with that, you know, like, uh, uh, Death, facing death, is not in itself such uh, such a problem uh, because Mrityu Sarvarasya uh, I am coming as death, Krishna says. So that makes it a lot better. If I had to deal with death, it would be a problem, but I'm not dealing with death, I'm dealing with Krishna. And, uh, well, I've tried to, to, to give my life to Krishna. Yeah. For the last 45 years and um, I've tried so Krishna is merciful I'm quite sure about that and um, I have tried to be a good devotee you know not that it was always perfect so I, I'll, I'll pray to Krishna I'll say Krishna please forgive me for my mistakes but please accept me and I think he will not just because of me, but I think all of us are in that boat. I think Krishna will. First of all, we have the prayers of Prabhupada, all the Acharyas, every, you know, we have all these extra prayers. So counting all that, I think we can be optimistic, and I am. Therefore, I'm not afraid of death at this stage. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the symptoms of the disease are a bit ugly, but anyway, you know, uh, I mean, it's going to get gruesome at one point, but uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll deal with it and uh, somehow or other roll with the punches. Um, that's that's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh-huh. Uh, now, initially, 
I kept it quiet for a while, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, because I have disciples, right? I felt that um, it's my duty to uh, to share this information because it also affects their life. Yeah. Okay, so we've done that, you know, I, and that's why I put out that uh, that message. And then since the message, you know, many people have come to see me with funeral faces and oh, they're going to die. And oh, we are so sorry. And we feel and all that. And they don't need to do that because I'm okay. Actually, I spend a lot of my time comforting people, right? It's, it's, it's most of the time it's me. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> all that. So, so, so no need, you know, like the way I see it, death is a change of service, right? No matter what will happen, I'm gonna carry on with devotional service. So really, it's a change of service. And uh, for the rest, you know, Krishna is there. And, Krishna will, uh, will protect us and will take care of us. I have no doubt about it. It's very inspiring to hear your realizations on that. And it is indeed, it, it, it's a change of service. That's, that's true. Um, but also we feel, you know, we feel s sad because of the, you know, all the, all the devotees, you know, in the past even few years, have, in, in the coming years as Burijan Prabhu put it the tri the the decade of tears I think he he said um it's uh it because for us it's we're losing the association of certain devotees and, yeah. and so that's what's upsetting I think yeah well yeah it's it's a little bit like the Bhakti Ratnakar you know and where Srinivas is trying to meet all the uh, great personalities um, the, the six Goswamis, you know, at least Rupa Sanat and Gadadar, and each time he comes somewhere, it's too late, it's too late, it's too late. So, uh, yes, this will be the time that many, um, of course, like myself, I am kind of uh, the age of the Prabhupada disciple generation, yeah, at least the younger ones amongst them, uh, you know. And many are older, like like many are like four or five years older or more than me, and some are a little younger than me, some prophet disciples. So, uh, uh, yeah, we are the boomer generation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that term? <laughs> and you know, these, these boomers, they just don't want, everyone says, the boomers just didn't want to leave, you know. And the X gen, the next generation, was just sitting there frustrated with these boomers. But I think the boomers are finally going to go. You know, they're going to go out with a bang. Of course. <laughs> oh, Krishna. <laughs> we, we are boomers, you know. <laughs> um, Maharaj, uh, you've preached in so many places. You've seen so many devotees, so many projects. What is your hope for ISKCON in the future? What do you feel is a hope that you have? Oh, I mean, I think ISKCON is, uh, is an amazing movement. It's Lord Chaitanya's movement is, is now coming through this vehicle of ISKCON and other, other Kodia movements and, uh, and changing the world. So that's going on, uh, you know, uh, with us, in spite of us, <laughs> you know, both, right? right. It, it goes on on a higher plane. So um, I have um, written something, a little booklet called Diving Deep. And that booklet describes uh, ISKCON in three layers. It said at the top, there is the organization. So on my eye height organization. The area of my nose and mouth in the middle is, is the process, the perfect process. And the deepest level below my head, that is where Krishna resides himself. So the organization at the top, right? 
Uh, that's the external feature of the movement. Yes? And in the beginning, we relate especially to that, to the festivals, to the temples, to what goes on. As we go deeper, we begin to realize it's, it's actually about chanting Hare Krishna, about the Bhagavatam, about going deep into these. As we're going deeper into our chanting and into the Bhagavatam, we begin to connect more with the very deepest level, which is where the Lord resides. Right? So we begin to connect with Krishna. Now, the Kanista Adhikari is, is basically busy on the external level. The Madhyam Adhikari is, is busy in the process. And the Uttam Adhikari is in the, uh, in, in, lives close in his connection with Krishna. So I look at the movement in these three layers. Right? Um, I think that we will always have devotees who are within these, are connecting to these three layers, yes, and it will inspire. So I think there will be deep inspired uh, personalities who will, uh, who will inspire and nourish this movement in every generation, and that will go on. I think that uh, there will be serious practitioners who will be the Madhyam Adhikaris who will carry a lot of the preaching, a lot of the things. And I think that there will be, be many people who will somehow connect, but who will find some difficulty in making a strong sambanda, a strong connection with the process and would ever stay a little bit on the external periphery. Mm. Yeah, so we'll see the movement grow like that. Um, you know, there was a time when we used to think that the Hare Krishna movement would spread and that uh, it would be very traditional. Everyone would wear dhotis and saris and <laughs> all that. And it would be a temple on every street corner. And I sometimes say, we thought it would spread like a nicely trimmed English garden or something like that. <laughs> It didn't. It didn't. It did spread like anything, but more like the Brazilian jungle. You know, it more, it more, yeah, it took all kinds of forms and shapes. Right. Um, I think that all these all these different varieties will grow. And where is the Hare Krishna movement in the beginning? Uh, it was everything under one roof. Right. We have been the everything under one roof movement. I don't think that it will continue in that way, the everything under one roof movement. I think you'll get maybe the Hare Krishna answer to the Jesuit order, you know, like led by maybe Krishna Kshetra Swami or somebody like that, you know. He sometimes talks about it. And, uh, you know, or you'll get like, uh, you know, you get your, your downtown, uh, your downtown uh, places where Krishna consciousness is is very soft and very integrated and very kind of cool and and you know um, very accommodating. You you get your yoga preachers. You get your back to earth people. You get your uh, you know you get your uh, yeah, you, you get your hardcore people, right? You know, it's like uh, so. I think all these things will will uh, segregate a little bit and go in their own own directions, and all these developments will coexist. And I think it's great. We need a core, a core. We need a traditional core somewhere to keep the uh, to keep the movement uh, strong. Um, and we need a lot of uh, different things about it. Like, you know, I know uh, I'm good friends with Vidaya on the March, Krishna West. Yeah, somehow or other, he's so lovable that I love him uh, dearly. And I go to see him sometimes. And inevitably, he wants to debate with me, although I don't really, I don't really want to debate with him. <laughs> I just come to see him, you know. It always turns into a debate, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, because I think 
that this is not just Indian, you know, this dress. Of course, I know a kurta is a Muslim uh, thing, <laughs> but enough for the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So, see. Yeah, I know it's a Muslim thing, the kurta. And, but uh, I do think that Krishna was wearing something like a dhoti and definitely not jeans or police sunglasses. Uh, so uh, I think that even in this, that, that when, when 5,000 years ago, uh, Krishna was in Vrindavan, right? That at that time, uh, he was wearing a dhoti. Yeah, I think so. And that, uh, yeah, it's even mentioned in Bhagavatam that Mother Yasoda was wearing a sari. So uh, I have a feeling that the culture that we saw 5,000 years ago in Vrindavan was fully transparent to the culture, to the eternal culture of the spiritual world. I also think that in Bhagavatam, we hear the gopis are singing ragas and, and, and so on. So I think that there's a certain amount of spiritual culture that has descended into into India and that, that makes India unique and that therefore we cannot just write things off as just Indian. Yeah. That's my okay. There I have a debate with uh, ongoing, you know, it's been going on for years. We'll never be resolved, but <laughs> okay. there I have a heavy happy debate, not heavy, happy debate mm. with uh, with Redine on the March. And um uh, who, uh, and I think it's fine. Let there be Krishna West. I'm in Africa, and there they want Afro Krishna. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a whole a whole different thing again. You know, they want to be African, and it's uh, it's it's natural, right? And it's going to happen. We have, after all, we have the Manipuris. You know, and traditionally they had a different style. Uh, yeah, the Gujaratis are the Gujaratis, and the Bengalis are the Bengalis, and uh, you know, and so on and so on. So, I appreciate that that point about you know that's quite broad broad minded. That uh, it'll show itself in different ways, like the Brazilian jungle. You know, that's an that's an amazing way to put it. It's not neatly cut like an English garden but it's gr it's grown but it's grown in its own way and i think that's what makes it beautiful there's just different varieties of of ways it expresses itself yeah, yeah. it was very interesting you know like uh, we had we had uh, um up to the uh late 80s we had the movement was in a in quite a rigid form right? right there was a very what you call the theocratic era you know and if you thought different from the church i mean from the uh leadership in iskon you were going to be burned on the stake right? yeah. that kind of atmosphere after that we got some sort of renaissance you know like when the zona chai era collapsed we got some renaissance in the sense that people started to think again for themselves Okay. And uh, that became uh, a time when people needed to be much more informed. People also started to, to question everything, started to experiment with everything. And that's definitely been stro a strong tendency in, in the new millennium. So the ISKCON of this millennium is very much the ISKCON where everyone for itself needs to figure things out. If you go back, you know, to the ISKCON of the 80s, then you're looking at like, well, what, what does the parampara say? What does the authority say? You know, like, like a, yeah. a very descending kind of uh, approach. But in that, you know, I was in a, in a Sankirtan party and it was hard for me because in that Sankirtan party, there were four devotees and there was one was a leader. And the motto was, don't think, ask your authority doesn't work for me <laughs> it's just like <laughs> i had a problem there you know because i can't turn it off i mean when you say something like that i start thinking about hmm what does that mean don't think is that okay yeah then i start thinking yeah so yeah 
It's interesting. In a way, it's good what we're going through. Uh, we've lost some strictness, you know, here and there. We have watered down a few things in, in the course of going the Brazilian jungle way. But at the same time, there is a, uh, uh, yeah, there's a time um, to, uh, to, to discover ourselves and stand a bit more on our own conviction than just on, on a system. Right. So that was good. Um, now that I'm on it, I also feel that like in the old ISKCON, uh, it, where everything was happening in the temples, the leadership was kind of based on a legislative model. Yeah. Then we turned congregational right, over time and we became a predominantly congregational movement. A legislative model doesn't work in a congregation. The only thing that works in a congregation is an inspirational model. Mm. So I see the future going there, you know, an, an inspirational model, not a legislative model. And I feel that the leadership of this movement will be challenged to be relevant. They already are, but if they ever, if they really want to lead in the future, they cannot legislate. If they try to legislate, it will fail. The only way it will work is through inspiration. It has to be an inspirational model. Um, I also feel that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking for, uh, with that, a, a natural leadership, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, Legislative has a certain structure, but yes. inspirational, what does that look like exactly? Yeah. Um, inspirational, yes, that's a good question. What does that look like? Um, I cannot write a script you know, for, the, right. for the future. That would be a little too much to ask. But um, a certain amount of structure will be needed. Uh, some, I'm not saying, uh, yeah, I think our, the properties that are in the name of ISCON need a certain amount of of legal protection and maybe even some sort of formal management uh, structures. But the movement as a whole, to make it successful and to harness uh, the interests of the people, um, will have to actually inspire people to, uh, to follow uh, Prabhupada's teachings. Uh, that's what an inspirational model has to look like. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm not a lover of 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 an ISKCON law book, right? I'm also not a lover of GBC resolutions that uh, go down the whole alphabet. You know, point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Um, I am a lover of uh, personal uh, relationships amongst leaders and followers. Uh, I sometimes dream of GBC meetings that more resemble uh, the sages of Naimi Saranya mm -hmm. that go into the forest for the, 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 the wise old man go into the forest and we ordinary mortals are waiting full of anticipation for them to come out of that forest with some really deep vision, you know, something like, like wow. And, you know, and you would certainly have a podcast with one of them. <laughs> okay, well, what was it like in the forest? Something like that. Now, okay, this is not a political statement at all. I, I'm not here like Viva la Revolution. I'm not here. Sure, sure. Shoot, shoot, shooting at the current leadership. I mean, we're talking about the future and in which direction I think it, it will have to go for the leadership to be relevant to to the, the people at large. So there's ins there's inspiration and then there's like relevance along with that. But what would you say is how can how in now, you know, I know there's the future, but now how can the leaders of the movement be more relevant? How do you feel? Yeah, well, now is an interesting time because we just spoke about this uh, Borijan state in the decade of tears, which indicates many of our leaders will be leaving in the next 10 years. Yeah. Some, some in 
some sooner and some a little later. Uh, so it also means that in terms of leadership, it's, it's the handover right now from one generation to another. And that's what we're looking at. And, and obviously, if you look at world history, as things are going from one generation to another, there also will be a different zeitgeist, a different spirit, right? according to the, uh, the time. So um, things are going to change. And uh, I think it's a time to, to allow younger leaders to come to the fore so that the, the, the handover is more, more natural less abrupt that's i think that would be what i would do if if i had some some say in that of course my mind is not there to tell you the truth you know i'm i'm not trying to manage iscon uh, I've, I've i've made a contribution to iscon and i continue to contribute to iscon but on the institutional level i'm not active now uh, hardly you know just winding up a few things a little bit in Vrindavan, a little bit in New York, um, and otherwise, I'm dealing with people, you know. Right. And I'll focus on people now. And as I'm as I'm going out, I will uh, I will certainly not look at at uh, the institution and what can I do for the institution. I'm going to look at how can I make sure that the people that I got involved with that they will carry on and that they will maintain a sense of community because you know iskan is made up out of different communities just like we can see the disciples of bhakti tirtha maharaj they're a community they have a particular flavor you know that maharaj gave them that and that's still alive you know yeah. um, and so on you know others right who have left bhakti Churu maharaj he brought this you know uh, Vaishnava etiquette and Vaishnava and devotee care and he made made a lot out of that and, and he was also interested in in preaching and and, and, uh, and new ways of outreach I mean the uh, you know the, the Florida project what's it called the, the land, what's the name the the land the, the land the land the land the land yeah that project uh, so. Okay, so Maharaj has a particular mood and that continues to live amongst his disciples. Yeah. So I'm trying to strengthen. I mean, I'm too busy with my own community right now. My hands full with that. Yeah, I love that point about dealing with people rather than... I mean, the institution is very important, but as far as your, your, your personal... What you're doing is that you're just trying to affect people at the... You know, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, re I mean, I realized that over the years, you know, like, okay, go away from from trying to manage an institution to getting involved with people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been very nice, actually, I must say. My life improved a lot, and it, it, it actually was more what I really uh, felt, uh, yeah, I really, really felt I should be doing. Um, what would you say to the point of, Okay, we have you as the central of the, your community, and you're helping inspire your disciples and your followers. <clears throat> and we all have our, you know, different spiritual masters and inspirations. But as Bhuri John Prabhu said, there's going to be a time when those devotees are not around anymore. What would you say to a community that is based around a person? How can they move forward when that person is no longer there? Well, that inspiration is no longer there. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, uh, I, I think we have to uh, all be servants of Srila Prabhupada and, and, and of Lord Chaitanya and, and very much be part of this, uh, this particular mission. Right? Right. Um, so I've made clear to my disciples, uh, I've, I've presented them with a little analogy of juggling three balls, you know, and one ball is the ball of personal well-being, right? Okay, keep my hand in the screen. The other ball is... Uh, I, can, oh, I can make you bigger here. Yeah, no, it's good. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. Though, like, yeah. 
<laughs> talking about juggling balls. Right. It's already the way the camera goes. What is is my left hand is uh, is, is is right is right. And so yes. So it's already yeah. like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's, there's more than juggling balls, but I'm juggling balls and hands right now. And there's three balls. One ball is personal well-being. Another ball is my sadhana, my bhajan. You know, sadhana sounds a little bit of my duty to chant, but bhajan means to, to also with taste. Hmm. So I'm looking after my physical well-being, my body, my mind, my the place where I live and, and all that. That's got to be right. Got to nourish me. Cannot be too austere for too long. Okay, some austerity, yes, but too much, not possible. Then I'm looking at my sadhana. I got to be able to, uh, to, to really get absorbed there and invest in it. And then I look at the mission. So I'm juggling these three balls, personal well-being, sadhana, and mission. Pers now, as it is in juggling balls, there's always one in the air. There's always one that you're catching and always one that you're throwing. So it's like that. Sometimes my sadhana has been in the air for a while and I have to catch it, you know, and then I have to give it a push and throw it up again. Other times my personal well-being has been neglected. That's how it is now. I mean, for me, I, at the moment, I have three days of personal well-being days, like, ah, <laughs> catching up because ever since I put that news out there, whoo, uh, people have been after me. Whoa. Uh, so I'm in a house somewhere, unknown location. <laughs> <laughs> Undisclosed. Indisclosed, yeah. That's right. Somewhere in hiding. And uh, yeah, and resting for a couple of days. Getting my visa for India. Um. So the juggling of these three balls is, is something I'm telling my disciples, I'm trying to make sure they keep their connection with Srila Prabhupada, that they do something for this movement, make a contribution, just like you're doing with your podcast. I, I appreciate that. You found a way, you know, something, okay. the way you can do it. Now you can put the screen back to the way it was because... Oh, okay. Sure. And, and, <laughs> yeah, better. And I'll see you again. Yeah. Um, you you said Maharaj that um, you mentioned some kind of red flags in the sense of uh, the the way the Brazilian forest can is growing. You know, some things get watered down, etc. But are there any other things that you feel like the devotees should watch out for in the future? Hmm. Uh. I don't know if I wanna wanna put red flags out there. Um, Maybe that's a strong term, but yeah, concerns. Yeah, or yeah concerns. Okay. Um, I'd I'd uh, I'd rather not not go there so much in my mind. Okay. Yeah. 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 Not only in in what I want to say, but in my mind, I don't go there so much. Um, I go more into areas where I think we should develop something mm -hmm. like I definitely I've always been an advocate of the human uh, the human aspect I think we have to invest in human relationships I think we should not be afraid to be human you know we I think our leadership should be uh, should be human uh, you know we came from a uh, mid 80s era where things were very uh, it was if you ask is the movement for the people or the people for the movement it was the people for the movement during at that time right I it was the mission and you know you just surrender to it or or get crushed by it it was a little uh, uh, we want something that's much more sensitive to people. Okay. People ring in as well. <laughs> <laughs> they actually can, but I have that capability, but I haven't done it yet. I see, I see. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, so 
I'd like to see a movement that is more a movement uh, where people are getting getting the attention and so on, um, and the mission, yeah, and then together we do something, something to to bring Krishna consciousness into the world. We'd better, if we don't do something to put Krishna consciousness out in the world, Maya is preaching full steam. Mm. She is there. She's there on her phone. She's there all around us. She is got a big a preaching agenda. So unless we stand up and put something, some energy in the opposite direction, we're going to be swept away. Yeah, many of us. Not Lord Chaitanya's movement, because his movement will carry on. But many of us might be swept away. We have to be careful about that. So we've got to do something, something creative, you know. And, you know I mean, book distribution is still book distribution. There's nothing wrong with book distribution as a preaching approach. If you can't or, or are not aspire to go that way, then think of another way, you know, a creative way. Uh, but somehow or other, let's do something to pass on Krishna consciousness to others. That I would like to see. You said one of the balls that we're juggling is also our personal bhajan, personal sadhana. Being someone who's done sadhana for many, many years, do you have any words of inspiration or any tips, practical tips that you can impart to our viewers on how we can better our sadhana and eventually, you know, get taste? And like you said, bhajan means, you know, doing it with some taste, affection, etc. Obviously, you know, it's it's nothing new that the mornings are, are gold, right? Mm. And uh, and that's the trick, you know. So sometimes they say you have to set the alarm clock at night so that you go to bed early enough. <laughs> you know, that is is a fact, you know. So early rising is is the key to absorption and um uh, yeah, that, that requires that adjustment to go to bed earlier. And uh, then, yeah, I used to, when I was temple president in Vrindavan, I used to get up at two, and then I used to chant my rounds before Mongolarity, and at least 16 rounds before Mongolarity, and then after I would read. Yeah. So in that way, I would, would also read for two hours every day. That's what we do. I I'd study Chaitanya Charitamrita for two hours. As the temple president, who's dealing That's with the... all kinds of other things. Yeah, yeah. But that uh, gave, gave me also the strength to deal with it, you know. Then, right, right. Then I go to the morning program, quarter past seven, be back for darshan, the Guru Puja class. And then uh, a little breakfast, and then like at 9.30, all hell would break loose. <laughs> 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 quite literally, quite literally. <laughs> But then I was ready for it, you know. Yeah. 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 I had a system also how to survive that and how to deal with that, you know. Uh, yeah. So you would say the mornings are the are the well, important. the mornings the mornings are important. Now if if for some reason uh, you know we are we really can't make it in mornings. I mean everyone has personal circumstances. So if the personal circumstances don't allow, then we have to start creating dedicated time in the day. Yeah. But we need somewhere some dedicated time for spiritual activity. If spiritual activity of sadhana bhajan is just something on the fly, a little bit around in the car, around in the supermarket, around, you know, I mean, those kind of rounds, yeah, okay, you know, at the end of the day, you have fulfilled the quota, I know, hopefully, um, you know, and otherwise, try again tomorrow. Uh, but better than that, of course, is, is just that little extra effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I say, if you can't do the morning, then preferably dedicated time in the day for spiritual uh, things. Um, yeah, and if you just just basically sleep and work, you know, sleep, work, eat, uh, I don't know. That's not much of a, of a of quality life. I think then maybe time to start 
create a new world situ a new life situation. Yeah. If life has gone down to yeah, work, sleep, eat type of thing, uh, maybe you live in the wrong uh, situation. Yeah. Maybe city life is not for you. <laughs> maybe you belong on a, on a on a on a farm or in a community, something, you know, something a bit more slow, something that gives more time. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of discussion points in the in the comment section. There's like 280 devotees now listening. Um, Maharaj, I'd like to just uh, field some of those questions. Um, I have a few here that I'd like to ask from devotees who have sent them to me um, earlier today. Um, if you could meet your 25-year-old self, oh, yeah. what five instructions would you give him? <laughs> That's kind of interesting question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in the introduction to my novel, I also speak to my younger self. So oh, I, okay. have, I have. When's that yeah. coming out? I have to finish it. You know, this is one of the biggest challenges right now to finish books. Right. Um, to my younger self, yeah, you know, uh, young people have. Uh, so much energy, have so much uh, desire, uh, so much uh, things to do. Uh, okay. Um, the most, when I was, I guess, one of the big things I learned in that shot, which came at 44 years of age, right, which is sort of like midlife, you know, a turning point, you might say. So there was a turning point in midlife, which was that um, I used to think that when I, oh, I'm going out of the screen again. That's okay. That's okay. I used to think when I was uh, uh, reasonable and it was about being reasonable. I thought, when I'm right, when I have an opinion and most people support that opinion, then I can feel confident that I'm on the right track. And then, you know, I'll, I'll go that way. And then people who don't agree, well, that's too bad, you know, because I'm trying to be reasonable. That's sort of was my approach. Um, later, after I was shot, I developed a new approach. And that approach was... Um, even if I'm in disagreement with people, I should not leave anyone completely dissatisfied. Hmm. I should somehow or other go out of my way to, to satisfy them to a degree. And that was, was a big change from the, from the mood of the 25-year-old, which, which lasted for 20 years, you know, hmm. till the mood from the 45 year old to the 65 year old right i'd say that was the big difference yeah. and that was the turning point came in that it's in that chapter all in one shot <laughs> right but, uh, awesome okay let's look at the comments here i there are so many that i uh, was reading but um there are a few that stand out um, you kind of answered this a little bit, but maybe we can touch on it some more. This is from Tiffany Cooper. Would you please ask Maraj what he feels is the most important thing devotees should focus on in this day and age to deepen our own practice and spread Krishna consciousness to more people? Uh -huh. Well, you know, Tiffany, I think that really uh, some things are timeless, right? And that we need to bring that timeless element into our life. The chanting, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. These are timeless connections that uh, are always, again, the source of strength. It doesn't matter whether Srila Prabhupada was doing that in, in you know, late, uh, late 19th century or uh you know or whether we are doing that right in the 21st century that's still the same uh, and i feel if we if we connect to that eternal to these eternal activities it is there where we'll find strength then 
we use our creativity to present things relevant to the people. We, uh, it's a, in terms of spreading Krishna consciousness, we need to be relevant. We just need to be relevant. And, um, you know, Krishna conscious practice, it's not only about practice, about cultivation, but, it's, but we should also think about it. You know, we should take some time to think, what am I doing? What am I actually doing here? And what am I actually trying to achieve with all of this? Right? And why am I doing this? I think, uh, so rather than go on automatic pilot in our practices, we should become, we should think about it deeply. What am I doing? Why am I doing? We become more conscious of, of what we're doing. Robert said we should be independently thoughtful. So I feel that that's it's very important to be thoughtful. And uh, yes, turn to the good old chanting Hare Krishna, turn to the good old Bhagavatam, be thoughtful, and then in spreading Krishna consciousness, be relevant. Let's just be what is relevant to them, what's important to them, what is there in Krishna consciousness that connects with that. Like, for example, the, the climate is an issue. It's not just an issue for a day. It's, it's a lasting problem, right? For our generation, the next generation, the climate. Okay, what's our response to the climate situation? What's the Krishna conscious response to the whole mess of pollution and la di da di da in the world? I feel... Now you've got a relevant platform. That's why when we're preaching in New York, I developed an idea that um, in the front of the building in Brooklyn, there is a, uh, a long room, maybe, well, in meters, 15 meters, 45 feet by, uh, by 12 feet by 4 meters uh, room. I want to turn that into an eco cafe where you have nice, first of all, nice juices. I'll grow vegetables on the walls and you can choose your own carrots. And I'm turning those into your glass of juice right there under your nose. Right. Yeah. <laughs> with, with, yeah. with the right type of juicer and, you know, and you can just drink your, your, your own, bio carrots from our wall and I'll grow more on the roof from farm to table. And uh, I think we should be relevant. And I think that's relevant mm -hmm. to the world of today because the world of today needs solutions for the climate, needs another way of life. And the eco agenda or a green agenda is something of relevance that attract that people are interested in. So. Yeah. Great. Um, here's another question, Maharaj. Maharaj, what is the importance for us as your disciples to have a foundational relationship with Srila Prabhupada? Well, you know, I mean, who am I? I am uh, nobody uh, exceptional. I am just someone who is here because he got a lot of mercy. Uh, it's that mercy that has lifted me up. And Srila Prabhupada has been like a giant carrier of that mercy. And he has carved out a space for us in the modern world. He has translated Krishna consciousness from a traditional form to, uh, to something that can exist in the modern world. That, of course, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta also greatly contributed to that and Prabhupada followed. But here's Prabhupada, who gives us a way of life in the modern world to be Krishna conscious. So we are all assisting Srila Prabhupada in that. And therefore, my disciples should, should not be blinded by my persona, you know, think, wow, Guru Dev. No, they should understand, yes, my spiritual master has done many things uh, for, for me and helped me in many ways. 
Um, but um, Srila Prabhupada is, is the one who gives us the bigger picture of Krishna consciousness and we fit, uh, we find shelter within that bigger picture that Srila Prabhupada offers. Um, sometimes I find that I'm inspired to dive deeper in, in my Krishna consciousness when life gets hard and presents its challenges. But how can I stay inspired to go deep when things are seemingly okay rather than at times of need? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're going to inevitably, inevitably, uh, going to have a wave effect in our spiritual life. Sometimes we'll be on top of a wave and sometimes we'll be just down on the lowest point. And these ups and downs we will face. I don't think anyone's going to uh, just be on a constant upwards motion. But gradually, the waves are going upwards. Something like going to Badrinath in the Himalayas. You know, you go over a waving road, but eventually you find yourself up there. Mm. So Krishna consciousness is something like that. And so ups and but we should not let the the downs go too low. And we built a network of the mode of goodness uh, to make sure that when we go down, we don't go down too far. So we establish many principles of goodness in our life. And, I, and all these principles that we hold on to of, 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 of Vaishnava behavior, right? of Vaishnava etiquette, um, that helps us to, to not go too low. And then there will be times that we'll be inspired and times that we struggle a bit, what can be done. That, that will carry on for time to come. Hare Krishna Maharaj, you taught me nectar devotion in Mayapur in 2004. Thank you. You're always so inspiring. What is one festival in ISKCON that you've attended which is etched in your mind? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there are many that are etched in my mind. Uh, you know. I think in the Jumna's festival, in the Jumna Maharaj's festival in Poland, is certainly something epic. Uh, but I must say, uh, all Ratiya, every Ratiyatra is etched in my mind. I love Ratiyatras, but there ain't no Ratiyatra like Soweto Ratiyatra. <laughs> I'll have to go sometime. It sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, that one. It's not the biggest Ratiyatra, but you know, but it is, uh, it's got a spirit. Mm. It's a Ratiyatra with spirit. It's just, it's a Ratiyatra done by people that love Ratiyatra. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> they have so much fun, you know. Yeah. And everybody is into the Kirtan. I think, and everybody, and they dance, and they all, go up and down, and they all know when to go down, and they all know when to go up, synchronized. Wow. It's, it's, it's somewhere. So Edo Rathiatra, I'd love to visit there sometime. Uh, Guru Maharaj, please advise us on the mood we must cultivate while visiting holy places and dams in India, especially Vrindavan and Mayapur. Also, if there is something important, keep in mind. Yeah, these, these dams, you know, are oceans of mercy. Huh? Mayapur, the, the abode of generosity. It's just inconceivable. The generosity of Lord Chaitanya in Mayapur, Odarya. Uh, uh, and Vrindavan, the abode of sweetness, Madhurya. So uh, Krishna in Vrindavan performed so many amazing pastimes. So we are going to these places because of Srila Prabhupada and by his grace. So we're doing some service there to Srila Prabhupada. So whatever, whatever service we do in the Dham is, is greatly beneficial. So let us be in a service attitude. Then going to holy places in the Holy Dham is, is also a service. And we visit all these places hear about them, 
from experienced Vaishnavas, learn more and more about the Dham and deeply try to connect in remembering Krishna. And then we'll go back to the temples. And if we can do a little seva there, yes, let's do. Because after all, Srila Prabhupada is the spiritual master who translated the word bhakti with devotional service. And so that devotional service is really the key, the key to entering into the Dham. We can be in these holy Dhams, but they are covered by a layer of illusory energy. If we want to penetrate, it is service that actually gives us the penetration into the deeper levels of the Dham. We didn't talk so much about Kirtan Baraj, but we, we all love your Kirtan leading. And here's a question. What is the proper attitude we should have when doing Kirtan? Chant for the pleasure of Krishna and the Vaishnavas. Um, I myself, when I'm chanting, uh, when I play harmonium, uh, and of course I know Kirtan Ras from, from Kirtan. And or Nam Ras, I know from Kirtan, sorry. I know Nam Ras from Kirtan. From, that's where I first met him in New Jersey. Who is this guy? <laughs> he's, he, he's, he sings pretty good. Hey, who's this? You know, and uh, I was also leading a kirtan there. I think in some hall or something. And oh yes, was, I recall that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's where I met you first. And yes. Yeah. I did, did a kirtan there, and, uh, and then he also he could say, "Hey, this guy." You know, hey, this guy knows how to lead a gear <laughs> And uh, well, Kirtan is not about competition and like, you know, like who's the greatest Kirtan leader of all. Uh, Nam Ras is, knows much more technical tricks than me, uh, you know, but. But I get more energy than he does when it comes to like the high. I've got a sixth or seventh gear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I only go to four. <laughs> that others don't have. So yeah. be, be yourself. Yeah. Be yourself and contribute what you can. Um, try and make your kirtan inclusive. You know, you're not, we're not doing kirtan alone. We're chanting together with devotees. So try and, like, you won't believe it, but when I'm alone, sometimes I do these, I do ragas and everything, right? And really complicated, like, uh, kind of stuff. But that I do alone because when I try to do this with an audience, I lose them. They, don't, they can't follow. I, so when I'm with people, I try to keep the tunes accessible. And I try to bring the people with me into the kirtan. I try to um, to be inclusive so that we together are making this offering to Krishna. Then I have my special, my, my special trait, you know, which uh, I am trying to make people mad when I'm doing kirtan. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, I'm trying to take my kirtans to a level where people forget themselves and and just become spontaneous. Yeah. Right. That's what I would call, when, when everyone starts to get totally spontaneous, then I think that was a good kirtan. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, what would you say to those people who have lost their compass in this movement? and are stuck in a rut? Oh, well, I would first of all say, it's okay, you know, don't make, don't, don't, uh, don't feel too bad, right? It's not always easy. So, you know, you're still one of us, and uh, we're, to, we're in it together, and uh, we'll uh, just, just stick together, 
and together we'll come out of it. You know, go to uh, yeah, go where the votes are. Maybe join some kirtans to get some new taste. Maybe visit the holy dom when you can. You know, just for some new look for some new inspiration, and and keep on going. Don't don't think that oh I'm a failure. I cannot do this. No, Krishna can help you. Krishna can make you do things that go be. He can empower us. He will empower you. Don't worry. You know. And Prabhupada says failure is the pillar, the pillar of success. From our mistakes, we also learn. So, um, and you don't have to be a super devotee. Just, just be, be there. Just stay. And in the end, um, so much mercy you'll get anyway. Yeah. Um, just like now, I'm in this situation with a doctor's notice, and I'm okay. I'm okay. And you will also be okay if you just live a life like a devotee. Then you'll be okay. Yeah. You don't have to be a super devotee, but just be a devotee. Um, avoid that. Yeah. yeah. And don't go, don't go back to sinful life and so on. It's, it's not worth it. You know, it's not worth it. Just be a devotee, somehow or other. And let's stick together, and together we'll make it. Yeah. We'll make it. And in the end, <laughs> there's only mercy. So much mercy. Maraj, I want to be mindful of your time as well. Do we have some more time with you that... Um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not doing anything but this today because otherwise okay. it's the rest day. So. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Uh, your message about going out of out of the way to pl please um, and satisfy others with whom we ha may have a disagreements with was very inspiring. Can you elaborate on what mood to carry on uh, while trying to do this? Uh, yeah, well, uh, obviously uh, we can... We have to, we, we cannot just be it cannot only be sentiment. Um, there has to be intelligence also in from. Uh, we don't want to leave them uh, completely dissatisfied, um, and we want to satisfy others we have disagreement with. But we can also not necessarily give them what they want, yeah, or give them everything they want. So then we have to give them at least something they want. So that's where the intelligence part comes in to judge how much we can give of what they want and how much we cannot. And then the rest, the rest of our energy, we just try to, uh, to build a relationship with them. And we try to actually uh, somehow or other uh, create some more positive uh, exchange on the human level. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the best we can do. So it's a combination of both. We're trying to, uh, you know, be kind, we're trying to listen to them, we're trying to be affectionate, we're trying to... Uh, but we also use our intelligence to see, well, how much of what they want can we actually give? You know. Uh, Hare Krishna, dear Guru Maharaj. Seeing that Maharaj loves to get the youth involved in Krishna consciousness, what can be the best motivation for the youth to take up devotional service? Seriously. Um, let them do it. Participation. Give them the wheel. Uh, the youth has energy, and it's very frustrating when you're young and they don't let you do anything. And all the <laughs> The, old, the older people, they have all the power and all the money and they don't give it to you. So give them the opportunity. Let young people do. Support them. Okay, try, inspire them. Sometimes they may need some, uh, some help, but let them do something. Let them also make some mistakes, whatever, but let them, give them opportunities. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. The other day, you know, like the, Someone went to my neighborhood to check out where I used to live, and there was one thing that happened when we were kids, and that was this. We had like a, a kind of an oval 
you know, I lived on not in the street, but on an oval. So in the, in the center, there was grass, you know, and one day uh, in the winter, we kids convinced our parents that we wanted to make this lawn into an ice skating ring. And, and for once, all the parents agreed and we made garden hoses from every house and we just flooded the whole thing. I mean, so much water and it all turned to an ice skating ring and we had our own ice skating ring and it was our idea and the parents for once cooperated. This was the highlight of my childhood, you know, this is like victory. <laughs> wow. So in Krishna consciousness, the same, let them do, let them develop some ideas and let them do and let us support. Then you've got the youth. Dear Maharaj, I was witness to the passing of my brother's death Friday, leaving deep impressions. What advice can you give to help grieving aspiring devotees with the passing of the soul, death, and accept Krishna's arrangement? Yeah, you know, uh, well, it is, it, is, it is certainly said when somebody we love passes away because we're simply, we're, we're suddenly cut off. We cannot communicate with that person anymore. Um, of course, we know that that actually life goes on after death and so on. And we know that, uh, that the destiny of a person uh, depends on his life. Uh, we also know that we can do something to help those other people. We can do something for them now. We can make offerings on them by their behalf. We can... Uh, we can worship a deity on their behalf. We can have a kirtan in someone's name. We can still do something also to benedict them. That helps. But yeah, the pain of separation from someone who has died, who is dear to us, and now we can no longer see them, talk to them, that pain, that's part of the script in this world. And we're living in this world. And that pain is inevitable. But it does help if we try to focus on doing something uh, that gives them a benediction, some, some puja, some offering, and so on. So that we can do, something to benedict them, and that will help us. Maharaj, as human beings, we tend to commit mistakes, and as a devotee, while doing devotional service, sometimes we may commit Vaishnav Aparad unknowingly. So how can we avoid this? Yeah, well, okay, this is not good. We should uh, try to avoid offenses and unknowingly we'll do anyway. I get, get some reactions for it, but not too serious um, if it's done unknowingly. Lord Chaitanya is also very generous, doesn't take offense so quickly. Um, that helps us. Otherwise, I don't know how we would advance in this movement. So although we should be careful to avoid offenses, we should not get into the mood of fear of offenses and turn our whole spiritual life into, oh my God, I have to watch out that I don't make offenses. And please, Babu, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I think I made an offense to you. I don't know what you're talking about, Babu. No, 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 but I think I really, please forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me a thousand times a day. You know, no, we should know. Lord Chaitanya is merciful. Let's try to avoid offenses. We do our best. Mm -hmm. and But let's try and meditate on doing something positive yeah. and not always think about how to avoid offenses, how to avoid offenses, how to avoid offenses. And so, how to avoid offenses? That's a little too much. <coughs> um, I have two more questions here, Maharaj. Uh, Oh, where did I have it? Um, do you have, looking back on your devotional journey in this life, where would you have invested more focus and determination? Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, we all had a, um, we all joined, we all joined a movement at a particular time. When I joined the movement, was uh, in motion. Um, there was an agenda, 
and it was a strong missionary agenda and i and you just had to go along with it there was a strong authority structure and that's how it was uh, so as a result um they wanted me in management now i have some karma for that my family comes from uh they're they're all business managers and, and various companies and so on so um that karma was certainly there um but i also dropped out of the family because i didn't want it mm -hmm. uh, then iskon wanted it right <laughs> and then i wound up in a in an office with a whole battery of secretaries in front of me and my father never saw me like that because he expired before but i'm sure if he would have seen me like that he would have laughed <laughs> he would have laughed and he said just see just see what you became yeah so you know i have other sides also sometimes i think what would have happened if i would have sat down with ayindra and i would have just done kirtan with ayindra imagine what if Nam Ras would have joined us as well? <laughs> wow. we, we would have had an amazing kitchen. I was there, you know, I could have said, hey, this is actually more me. I'm the musician. Right. I'm a, I, you know, it's like, what if I would have just, that's what I did before Krishna consciousness. I was a musician. And now, what if I would have just gone for the musician that I actually still am? I would be much better today than I would have been than, than where I got now. Imagine what kirtans we could have had. <laughs> yeah, we never had those kirtans. Shame, shame, shame. Um, there's also the scholar Kadamba Khan Swami. What books could I have written if I would have had gone more into that direction, more into the scholarly direction? I could have done really something. Um, I'm still trying to do now in my last days. I'm trying to finish two books. I'm trying to finish a, an extensive books on Chaitanya, uh, Charitamrita and biographies. And that's kind of a serious uh, scholarly book. And I'm trying to finish this, this novel, which is a creative uh, thing. And uh, well, uh, I hope Krishna, and the devotees will give me the time to write these books. <laughs> Krish, hope Krishna may make me live long enough, and I hope the devotees may leave me alone enough. So, <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> so that they can write these books. Because otherwise I won't be able to do it. You know. Mm. Um, so this is uh, something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, what you could have been. I think in the end, you know, what it doesn't really matter so much. Mm. In the end, what really matters is that we did something for Krishna, whatever it was. And, uh, and destiny took us in a certain direction. And so be it, as long as it was for Krishna. There mm. is no, no loss, no loss. Yeah. It's all okay. So on that same line, would you say no regrets? No regrets. No regrets. Awesome. Well, Maharaj, it's been really wonderful having you here on the show. Um, I wanted to just, uh, one last thing was if you have any closing statement for our 200, almost 300 devotees listening, any closing statements? Well, I, I, I really appreciate uh, what people like Nam Ras are trying to do, you know? that are trying to find a cutting edge, right? That they are going they're sensitive to the times, to what, what lives in, in this world of today. And, uh, and they plug in and they connect Krishna consciousness uh, in that particular format. And I think that's really uh, awesome. You know, and I would love it if, if, if all you also think of your own creative ways 
to uh, to make a contribution and something you like to do, you know. Uh, there are so many ways people do that. So I feel use your own creativity and harness it, and you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed once you start doing a creative work, it will be nice. Now, grant you, some people feel more comfortable in the background. And that's also good. Then support people that, that want to be in the foreground. So I'm not trying to push everyone. You must be in the foreground. Uh, if you feel comfortable in the background, then contribute from the background. And sometimes that's equally important because I'm quite sure that there are, there's a whole team of people behind Namras and that team of people, they are, certainly uh, very important for the show that we are having here today there's one very important person my wife tulsi who takes care of kids <laughs> while, I, while i do this <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah i knew there was someone <laughs> and uh, thank you. i thank you namras for having me here thank you and, uh, you know uh, there's always more that you, that you that you can say, could have said, should have said, would have said, but that you didn't say, and such is life. Right. Always yeah. something that we could have done, should have done, but didn't do, and then time's up, and that's it. And then that's what it became, Yeah, my destiny. And so here we are at the I end feel, of it yeah. all. I feel so inspired, Maharaj, getting your exclusive association here. I, I I do this really in a selfish way. These shows I've done about 114 now, and it's it's a very selfish thing because I get the association of one of the full devotees like yourself, and you know devotees can watch it and and see it afterwards. But uh, I I'm really um, I feel I just feel so blessed to know you and to be talk with you and. Um, I hope the very best for you in 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 your uh, next coming months. Um, and if I could be of any service, please do let me know. Uh, for our listeners, um, as I said, I've done a, a 114 other episodes with various devotees from various groups on various topics. Uh, so please like and subscribe uh, to my channel here. And um, we will see you soon. Um, and thank you again, Maharaj, for, for joining me. I'm just going to turn off the, the recording and uh uh we'll talk afterward okay hari krishna everyone thank you everyone for listening hari bol oh,